Walla Walla University. He's been on the faculty there since 2001. He also served as the Dean of the School of Theology for 17 years from 2001 to 2018. He is now focused um, primarily on teaching and writing. Some of his classes include systematic theology, preaching, Christian leadership, and Christian apologetics. Christian apologetics, uh, I took in college with him and it was one of my two favorite classes in college. It really um, changed my worldview, helped expand and sharpen it. I was one of the many young minds that he has introduced to Viktor Frankl, Ravi Zacharias, and others. So thank you for that class. And also last fall, Walla Walla University named him the distinguished faculty lecturer for this academic year. He spoke on the nature of Christian belief, and that talk is still on YouTube and the Walla Walla website if you'd like to watch it. Dr. Thomas was born near Cape Town, South Africa in Somerset West. Some of you may recognize that town because that's where the Adventist Hildeberg College is located, and that's where my dad did high school. Um, Dr. Thomas was born to British missionary parentage, and he grew up throughout Africa, in South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Kenya. And he also did a little stint in Bering Springs, I think, while his dad was at Andrews. And then, similar to my dad, Dr. Thomas immigrated to the United States for college. He went to Atlantic Union College and graduated in 1975. Then he went on to get his Master's in Divinity at Andrews in 1978. And then later he got his doctorate in pastoral ministry in 1999. And the dissertation was titled, A New Evangelistic Paradigm Using Foundational Theology Issues as an Apologetic Instrument for Evangelism in a Secular World. After receiving his MDiv in the 70s, Dr. Thomas spent 24 years in pastoral work in New England and Walla Walla State, in Walla, as Washington State in Walla Walla. His pastoral experience ranges from multi-church multi districts to multiple staff churches. In 2001, he, trans he transitioned from pastoral work to professorship at Walla Walla University. Dr. Thomas met Laura Lee Minty while at college. She was an elementary education major, and they were married in 1975. Uh, Laura Lee currently teaches at uh, Rogers Adventist School. They have two sons, Matthew and Sarah, who are walking in right now. Sarah and I went to college together. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew and I went to college together, and Sarah and, and I did med school together. Um, Matthew works as a structural engineer in Spokane, and he plays the organ beautifully. And then Jonathan is a financial controller at a hospital in Los Angeles. Away from the classroom, Dr. Thomas has, um, he enjoys restoring old cars. A 1930 Model A Ford is a recent one. And he also does woodworking, uh, shaker style furniture. And then my favorite is, is he drives uh, big trucks, really big wheat harvest trucks. You know, like the Peterbilts and uh, Kenworth. So you, so you have the combines that harvest the wheat and then they put them in those big hauling trucks that haul hundreds of tons of wheat. He drives those, which I just think is so cool. Um, Dr. Thomas, thank you for coming. We are so excited to uh, hear what you have to say and to learn. Um, I'm going to offer a prayer, and then Dr. Thomas will come up and uh, get started. So please bow your heads. Father, thank you for creating us as curious, free-thinking, free-willed, intelligent beings. We often misuse these gifts in our fallen state. Uh, but please bless us this evening. Please bless this meeting. Please bless Dr. Thomas as he speaks on how we actually know things on faith and on, on our worldview. And please bless us. It's Friday night and help us to clear out the clutter that is in our minds so that we may listen and think and reflect to hear your still small voice and to use our curiosity and intelligence to grow in our understanding and love for you. Amen. Well, good evening to you. I'm glad to be here. And I found out that um, Dr. Ashley knows a lot about me. <clears throat> and, and pretty much everything she said she was true, except that my Model A is not a recent restoration. I bought it in 1979 for $150 in the state of Maine and spent, spent four years restoring it. And if I had known she was going to mention that, I would have had a picture for you to see. In fact, it was here uh, when my son and, and his uh, got married here, Sarah and Matthew got married, my car was here if you happened to be there on the occasion. So, Anyway, um, I'm glad to be here. Um, when I was asked to come here, the instructions I were given is that you all would like something that had fairly robust cognitive value. 
that uh, what I'm talking about here tonight is, um, is um, especially tomorrow during Sabbath school and tomorrow afternoon you will have to put on your cognitive helmets. Um, I'm not doing that just to show that I can do it. I'm doing it because I found out that the things I'm going to talk about here have great relevance to people's lives. And if you hold on tight uh, and you understand it, um, you could have the similar experience to the one mentioned here tonight. So tonight I'm going to be talking about making sense of grand reality. And I want to begin with a quote from Elton Trueblood. Elton Trueblood was um, a Mennonite scholar. And he's written quite a few books and I am very pleased that I have a bunch of them. I have been able to glean them from here and there and some have been given to me. And uh, this one here, this one quotation struck me some years ago. He wrote, the value of an intellectual inquiry lies not in its ability to tell us what we ought to do, but rather in its ability to surmount the barriers that hinder our doing. And I would like to adjust the word doing there and include also our thinking, our acceptance of ideas. That in the world today, there are barriers that prevent us from accepting certain thoughts or doing certain things, a lot of them connected to religion. So continuing the careful study of the philosophy of religion is helpful, not because in most instances it brings men to God, but because it fulfills the humbler role of removing barriers to requisite con uh, commitment. Um, I would even leave the philosophy of religion out of there, the study of philosophy. And I know that in many Christian circles, um, there's a great reticence, a reluctance to talk about philosophy. And uh, I had to process that in my life um, because the truth of the matter is, uh, if you put any two thoughts together, you have exercised philosophical uh, skill of some kind, elementary though it may be. So it's, philosophy is not the problem, it's the product of philosophy that you have to watch out for. And if you read the philosophers, you will understand that they have come up with some pretty wild ideas. But philosophy and theology are quite interconnected and they serve each other well, the process of philosophy. So um, I, one way of looking at what I'm talking about tonight is to borrow a term from Michael Screven, who talks about primary philosophy primary philosophy. And I, I like to use a house illustration. If you think about a house, you know it has roughly four major parts or systems. The interior finish with the content could be one. The framework for the walls and the roof could be another one. The floor structure could be another one. And then you have the foundation elements. And if I were to ask you which one of those components is the most important to the stability and longevity of the house, which one would you pick? Yes. And then I have a question for you. When you bought your house, how much time did you spend inspecting the foundation? Yeah, the answer is probably zero. And I'm reminded when I first moved to Walla Walla, I was looking for a house to buy and the realtor took me out to a, uh, on, the, on the southeast side of town toward the mountains, a nice location, and he showed me a house. And uh, as, I, as we drove in the driveway, I noticed that uh, the garage door on the left, there was a gap of about three inches, and on the right, there was, it was tight. And so I was very curious, and because I like crafts, I like a big garage. In fact, I'm very proud of my garage. It's 24 by 36 feet. Um, if you can top that, let me know afterwards. But um, I, I looked at it, I wanted to go in there, and uh, the, the realtor didn't really want me to go in the garage. And finally I insisted and, and I went in, the floor was all cracked and the gap was there. So I went around outside and I discovered that, um, you know, Walla Walla is on alluvial soil and somehow the, the downspout of that house had been um, come loose and the water had run down and washed the soil away and the whole foundation had sagged three inches. So guess what? I didn't buy that house, see. But you're correct that the foundation Although it's the least conspicuous part, we bury them in the ground. It is the most important part of the, of the house. And there's a picture here that I want you to look at. And um, I I've ignore the creation evolution statements at the bottom there. I don't really care about those. I'm not here to debate creation and evolution. Um, I want you to look at this. That the, the, on the one side, and that would be on your right, you have the Christian brothers. 
and uh, they are loaded uh, armed for warfare and you will notice the one on the top tower has fired a weapon apparently just for the delight of hearing a bang it, it doesn't seem to be going in any direction um, the one in the middle tower has aimed his uh, weapon at one of his colleagues and is about to blast him and the other one who is actually firing in the, in the direction of the enemy has succeeded in popping a balloon and if you look at the balloons, they, they have different social issues uh, addressed in, and he managed to hit one of those and destroy it, and he's thrown his arms out in jubilation. On the other side, which in this uh, is called humanism, and again, I don't really care about the titles, I care about the picture. You notice that with a fairly grim, satisfied look on his face, the enemy soldier has fired, not up in the air, but fired at the foundation of the castle. Now who's going to win this fight? It doesn't take long to think about that. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So um, I'd like you to see my talk tonight as a conceptual footing. And uh, I have been involved in the building trades, not as the contractor, but as a hired hand on several occasions. And I've had the opportunity to build, be involved in building houses all the way from the ground up and on the in the picture here you see a footing they are not very handsome they're not something that you really want to look at but you'll notice here that that is where the house actually comes in contact with the dirt okay and uh, the, sh the shape of the footing determines the shape of the house the size of the house how big the house can be so although you never see it it's actually determinative this is what determines the stability of your house, the shape of the house, the bearing capacity of the house, all kinds of things are determined by the footings which nobody will ever see again as soon as the uh, dirt is pushed around it. Okay. Um, one more illustration, this diagram with some ovals and circles here. Um, another way of looking at this tonight is if you start in a little circle in the middle, that describes what we do. What we do is encompassed by what we believe, which is the bigger circle. What we believe is governed by hermeneutical principles. And if you're a theologian or a philosopher, you know about hermeneutical principles, the very complicated rules that pertain to the use of language and interpretation and how you properly make up doctrines. And if you do it the wrong way, then your doctrines are bogus. So hermeneutics, um, I was discouraged by the discovery that in the Christian world there are about 38 competing theories and you wonder why we can't have a steady agreement. That's one reason. But the part of this diagram that interests me tonight is the biggest circle, the ideas that govern our hermeneutical principles because the truth of the matter is that surrounding all of the rest of our living or in the basement of it are some assumptions, some ideas that we adopt oftentimes without even knowing they are there. So that's kind of an introduction, trying to contextualize what I'm talking about. My point of beginning is this one. We are all part of a reality we did not ask to join and one we do not fully understand. And I don't think any of you will dispute the, those two claims, right? None of you asked to be present uh, on this parade. And I don't think any of you here would b bravely say that I understand the whole of it. Right. Um, not only that, but we are temporal beings who struggle against the reality that an old German preacher once described to me this way. He said, Pastor, the problem is we get too soon old and too late smart. And then he said, also, we have no rewind button. Okay, so you're doing this journey once. You're up against the fact that you're a temporal being who if you're not careful, we'll be too soon old and too late smart. I'll let you think about that. See. Um, in addition to that, we live um, faced with a never-ending vulnerability. And I, I ran across a wonderful quotation which I'm going to read to you tonight, although you can probably read it to yourself, but this is from Daniel Taylor who wrote a book entitled The Myth of Certainty. And uh, I'm curious enough that when I saw that title way back in 1999, I immediately ordered it. I said, I have to read this book. See, I now have another book entitled The Sin of Certainty, which I'm working my way through. Anyway, 
Um, Daniel Taylor said, from our earliest moment to our last, we are vulnerable. Destruction, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, threatens us at all times. A fall from a curb, a lost job, a bitter word, a public humiliation, at every point we feel the hazards of life. And here comes the continuation. The bulk of human activity of every kind aims at lessening that vulnerability. And I'll pause there to make the point that one of the reasons why Western-style civilizations are so highly desirable in the minds of many people in the rest of the world is that we have done a better job managing vulnerability than other places have. You know, there are, other, there are some places today where if you get an infection or you come down with appendicitis, your life is seriously at risk. You may well not survive. Um, if you have an accident, there's no 911, there's no, there's no ambulance to carry you to hospital, see. And so, um, we, we, we live in a crazy society where you can actually have an accident. How fast was uh, Tiger Woods going? We don't know, I suppose, it's a, it's a secret, but he had a massive crash and he survived because of the technological um, elements, airbags and so forth, that, that uh, helped help save him, see. So, he continues on, making money, seeking love or accomplishment, buying insurance, courting power, wearing the right shoes, writing books, having children, reading books, not having children, not reading books, all these and countless other daily activities are ways of protecting ourselves from the myriad threats to our sense of personal safety and well-being. So, add to all of that, uh, this Josiah Royce's dichotomy. I happened upon the writings of Josiah Royce a few years ago. He wrote quite a long time ago. His book was published in 1912. But he had a very interesting idea that captivated my mind because he says, in his opinion, that we as human beings have an innate sense that there is some greatest good that we are on this world to achieve. But we live with attention because as we are normally constituted, we are in grave danger of failing to accomplish that go greatest good. And here are his exact words. There is some end or aim in human life which is more important than all other, all other aims so that by comparison with this aim, all else is secondary and subsidiary and perhaps relatively unimportant or even vain and empty. See. Um, and then he goes, that man, that man as he now is, or as he naturally is, is in great danger of so missing his highest aim as to render his whole life a senseless failure by virtue of coming short of his true goal. So this is his way of describing uh, an inherent tension that exists to varying degrees in, in human life, that you have this urge to achieve something significant, and yet if you don't somehow discipline yourself or steer in the direct direction, you run the risk of failing to, to achieve that, and then your life feels like it's been wasted. See? Now, it's from within these circumstances that you and I have to try to make sense out of our reality and find purpose and meaning in our lives. And um, the book by Viktor Frankl was mentioned here tonight. If you've never read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, you should have gotten it yesterday. Um, it's a book that was written by a, an Austrian Jewish psychiatrist who was caught up in the, the Holocaust. He spent four years in some of those death camps that we hardly dare speak about, and he survived. And he observed human life at the most basic um, condition you could ever see. People have said that the, the, the conditions were so basic that they are beyond deceit. You, can, you can't be deceptive at that level. Um, he, he comes up with some very interesting observations about meaning and then the power of meaning in, in human life. Okay. But how do we go about making sense of grand reality? And the answer is that we do it by somehow cobbling together a picture of grand reality into which we can place ourselves from which we can then draw down reference points for our living. See, that's what we do as, as cultures. And uh, you will see here a fanciful picture of grand reality. And I have to tell you that I love this picture. It's fanciful, mind you. It's not describing reality. But if you look at it, you will see on the, on the what? The right-hand side, you will see a bucolic scene. There is a little village by a little lake with a tree and the sun is shining down from the dome of heaven and the fields are green and there's hills in the background. And above it arching is the dome of the sky. 
with the stars attached to the dome of the sky and the moon. And then in the left hand corner there is this curious human being um, who has managed to get to the edge of the dome of the sky and poke his head through because he wants to see what's making the reality he is a part of operate and you will notice in the upper left corner you will see wheels within wheels and rolling spheres. Okay. Um, it's a, it's a great picture. This man is curious. He wants to know what reality looks like, not only what he can see, but what's behind it. And then, of course, the, the next picture is one that you are probably a lot more familiar with. This is a, a picture, an artist's depiction of an ancient view of reality. Um, you can see there that uh, there's the earth, which is kind of a flat place with lakes and stuff. And I have to pause to tell you, I had a unique experience this week. One of my students in one of my classes came to talk to me after class and he told me, he says, well, we were talking about some of this stuff, he says, well, he says, I'm going to tell you this. I am a serious flat earth society person. And I talked to him for about 20 minutes. He is absolutely persuaded that the earth is flat. And he has a website and I, I know, and it was a genuine conversation. He's a very, very fine, charming young man. But he, he said, I, I'm persuaded. I said, well, what do you do about the picture from the moon? Where they, he said, well, that's a fake picture. You know. um, once you create a theory, you, know, you can make everything fit it if you work hard enough. But anyway, um, I, I'm not speaking badly of him. I'm actually quite admiring of the young man that he was willing to tell me that. And I, I applaud him. I will have more conversations with him. Okay. Um, but you'll notice here that there's the earth with some mountains. The dome of the sky in this case is made out of stone of some kind and if you can see carefully there are windows and floodgates and above that are the waters above the firmament and if, I, if they had completed this picture above that would be the domain of the gods or of God and then down underneath you have the underworld and you'll notice that the ocean encompasses everything because in the ancient world the land always ends where? With water. So it's very obvious that the water must be everywhere. And then you have the, the roots of the, of the mountains that go down. And in the ancient world, your knowledge did not extend beyond that. We, we know they have the roots of, the, of the, the land that go down. Where does it go? I don't know. And you see this reflected in the Bible. You remember the story of Jonah when he was in the belly of the great fish? Do you remember what he prayed, what he said? He said, I have going down to the roots of the mountains. See, this, this view of reality is present in the Bible, in the early parts of the Bible. It, it changes later on, but this is a picture of reality. And um, nobody here tonight believes that this picture depicts reality. But you understand that for thousands of years in the ancient world, this picture of reality enabled people to live sensibly. It, it, this picture of reality was, was of enough substance that they could place themselves in there somewhere and thereby derive reference points and figure out who I am, where I am, where I'm going, where history is going, how to relate to the, the greater world. Uh, so what I'm saying to you is that your view of reality does not even have to be correct in order to work. See, very encouraging, right? So, um, these, these concepts, these pictures of reality, provide a map into which we can place ourselves. And once we have placed ourselves, we have a context for our lives. You can tell where you came from, you can tell where you want to go, you can tell what's up and what's down. You can, the, the, these, um, these reference points create a sense of right and wrong benefit and, and whatever the opposite of benefit is. Most significantly, those pictures of reality create a preferred, a picture of a preferred future that we are captivated by. And I, I have a, another quotation, and I, I hate to read them to you, but I'm going to read them to you because I have to. Um, there's a gentleman, K.A. Smith, who's written a remarkable book in which he points out that what really happens in human life is that the picture of reality, the pre preferred future that we adopt, does not drive us. It lures us forward. It captivates our imagination. Um, 
And, and here, here is the, the quotation. Um, Our ultimate love moves and motivates us because we are lured by this picture of human flourishing. It is not primarily our minds that are captivated, but rather our imaginations that are captured. And when our imagination is hooked, we are hooked. Those visions of the good life that capture our hearts have thereby captured ourselves and begin to draw us toward them, however implicitly or tacitly. The goods and aspects of human flourishing painted by alluring pictures of the good life begin to seep into the fiber of our being, that is, our hearts, and thus govern and shape our decisions, actions, and habits. He continues, thus we become certain kinds of people. We begin to emulate, mimic, and mirror the particular vision that we desire. Attracted by it and moved forward by it, we begin to live into this vision of the good life and start to look like citizens who inhabit the world that we picture as the good life. This, by the way, is why fashion is so powerful in human experience. It creates a vision of a preferred future that captivates your imagination, and then you have to do whatever you have to do to look like that. See, and I, I, was, I was chuckling when Melania Trump... Uh, at the inauguration of the previous president, she came out in a certain dress and I, I heard a news report the next day that by the next day, every one of those dresses was sold. People found out how it, what it was, gone like that. See, they, they were captivated by um, a vision of, of how they would like to be. Uh, continue, we become little microcosms of that envisioned world as we try to embody it in the here and now. So many of the penultimate decisions, actions, and powers we undertake are implicitly and ultimately aimed at trying to live out the vision of the good life that we love and thus want to pursue. And I'm constrained here to make a little deviation to talk about my Model A Ford, because if I had thought I was going to do this, I would have had not only a picture of the finished version, I would have had a picture of it the way I bought it. And the way I bought it is a very sorry thing. It was sitting in the woods, um, the engine was out on the ground with the engine, the, the cylinder head off. There were no fenders, no wheels. There was the body there. Somebody had had a fire in it and burned some of the wooden bows in the roof. Somebody else had tried to cut off behind the driver's door to cut the rear of the car off so you could put a, a bed in there and go into the woods and, and get a cordwood, but they hadn't finished the job of cutting it off. And I, I saw that, and guess what? It stole my heart. Why? Because I pictured it the way it could be. And of course, when I brought it home, um, a number of people thought I'd lost my mind. Um, of course, I only paid $150 for it. But um, I took that thing apart, every single piece, I took it apart, and I restored each piece, and I put it back together, and it looks pretty good, the finished product. And if I put the old picture next to the new picture, you would understand how the mind of Dave Thomas at one time was, my imagination was captivated by a picture of a preferred future that in some ways is very mundane. Okay. But this is what religion does in life. Okay? And I, I, I make another digression here to say that to me one of the very interesting things about Adventism is that ours has been a religion that is captivated by hope. What's the blessed hope? It's a picture of a preferred future of what will happen on the day Jesus returns. And Adventists have been lured by that for 170 some, uh, some years, which is very different from being scared by hell. You know, the urgency in some forms of Christianity come from hell. They were going to scare you. I was going to say we'll scare the hell out of you, but I'm not allowed to say that. We, we will scare hell out of you and thereby get you into heaven. See, and uh, when I realized that some years ago, it made me very happy that I am, I am drawn forward by a hope. I'm not driven by a fear. See, and I leave you to think about that, see. So, um, I mentioned already that our picture of grand reality do not have to be true in order to work, and that is actually um, sometimes a surprise to people. But moving along, the pictures of reality that we adopt are actually ensconced and propagated by ways of stories that have explanatory value. Now we are story creatures, we love stories, um, we like to hear stories and I, if you ever are standing in the pulpit preaching and the congregation drifts away, all you've got to do is start a story and everybody's back there. 
And for years I've, I've done this with children who come to visit. I ask them, would you like to hear a story? And you go and get a children's book and pretty soon there's like six of them. They're all sitting right there. They, they want to hear the story. And, um, you know, those stories, in every culture there are stories that have explanatory value. Right? And those stories are very significant. Here is, is one comment. Um, the biggest questions demanding the most rigorous intellectual analysis are really doctrines that arise from a particular story that we either assume or embrace with co explicit conviction. And then there's Leslie Ann Fields, and I, I have to say, this woman is an English teacher. I forget where she's a teacher, but way back in 2012, she had a marvelous article in Christianity Today where she talked about the power of story, of narrative. And, and here are some words from her. She said, we are story creatures who live in a God-made story-shaped world that, itself, that began, itself began with the words, in the beginning. And she goes on there, oh, oh, I guess it's on the next one. This writing, narrative, and reading it is an act of faith that places us in time and space, locating us in a chronology that suggests by its very order both cause and meaning for our lives. She talks about how the story's narratives actually war against the randomness of our lives and, and make it feel like life has coherence and it matters, okay, stories. And this, this uh, slide here, before we knew the terms narrative theology or emergent church or postmodernism, we knew s the stories and the events. And you see the list there, in the beginning was the word, and you can read down the list there. The rich man died and was carried into Abraham's bosom. If you know your Bible, the minute somebody starts that story, the whole thing comes to mind. And the fact that you know those stories creates a, a context for your life, okay? And I like this next quote, a bigger story. Here in its pages, meaning the Bible, appear fierce and unlikely heroes, terrifying battles, pilloried prophets, resistant saints, miraculous healings, a foot-washing king, a bloodied god on a cross, a hollow tomb, the final wrath and glory judgment and a denouement that ends more miraculously than anything we could imagine, the coming of a new city with open gates and a purified people, now called sons and daughters who needing no other light will enter and walk by the light of the Lamb. Isn't that a marvelous quotation? Okay. A big story, and I could have included one here by Leslie Newbegin, who I think is a very substantial writer, who says that if you study all the, the religious literature of the world, no story matches the big story that you find in the scriptures. See? And how does this work in life? Well, it simply works by this way. It creates a picture of reality, and we draw down our reference points often by inference, not by deduction, not by, uh, well, by induction and also by abduction. And, uh, you know, induction and deduction are well known. Abduction really is the kind of knowing that takes place when you have a preponderance of evidence that persuades you. And those are the things that we infer, okay? And we place these inferred truths into an internal capacity that is built into all human beings that is actually part of spirituality. The capacity to gather, evaluate, and be guided by a collection of beliefs. And so we journey through life. We draw down from these pictures of reality reference points that we ensconce within this internal capacity to believe and be guided by beliefs, and we journey through life. Now, in talking about this, I've been interested to notice that some people talk about a belief web, other people talk about a belief grid. What they're saying is that inside your mind, you have a collection of beliefs. You can compare it to a web with major strands and minor strands, or you can compare it to a grid with all these data points. Okay, I don't care which one you use. I'm more accustomed to talking about a grid, and so I journey with that. And if you were to, to um, lay out a person's belief grid, you would discover that the belief elements range from life and death matters to the very mundane, and I have two examples there. Do I deny Christ and face death, or do I recant and live? This was a, 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 a decision that early Christians had to make. Life and death. Okay. They consult their belief grid and they make a decision. Or you could take a very mundane one. Should the paper on the toilet paper roll come off of the top or off of the bottom? And I know every one of you has an opinion about that. Okay. 
And not only that, I bet you've been in somebody else's restroom where it was the wrong way and you fixed it. <laughs> See? See? And the fact that you're chuckling is a, is a formal confession, I think. See? See? So the point is that th there, there are different levels and significances. Some beliefs are life and death, some are very mundane, but they're all present in your belief grid. They have been put there, you have put them there over time. And what happens is that as we face decision making, we run the possibilities through our minds, through our belief grids, and they tell us yay or nay. Okay? Um, Viktor Frankl, in that book I mentioned earlier, um, he talks about the fact that in life we are faced with two things, potentialities and actualities. And I like the way he talks about this. Potentialities are all the possibilities that lie in front of you. And of course, the younger you are, the more of those are out there. And in a society such as ours where there's a great deal of freedom, there are who knows how many potentialities. But he points out that potentialities have no substance. They, they are not real. They're only possible. But the interesting thing about them is that they all have attached to them consequences. That if you select that potentiality, the consequences come into your life as a result of that. Many potentialities are mutually exclusive. For example, if you decide to get married, the minute you do that, what happens to all the possibilities that relate to not being married? They are gone. If you decide not to get married, then all the ones pertaining to marriage are gone. And you, you, know, you, you, you can't go back and, and fix that. All right? um, so, what happens in this, as we, we're, we're trying to decide between potentialities, which ones will become actualized in our lives, and um, I should say that actualities are very different from potentialities because once they enter the stream of time, eternity itself will not change that. Okay? So, uh, whatever you select or whatever is selected for you, and one of the sad things about life is that sometimes the, the adverse actions of other people force potentialities to be actualized in our lives that we don't like. Once they're there, you can't get rid of them. And by the way, I love the fact that um, Viktor Frankl points out, and sorry to those of you who are younger, uh, those of you who are older will like my comment here. Viktor Frankl says that if you have reached an old age or an, uh, advanced age, whatever you want to call it, and have managed to acquire a record, if you've managed a collection of actualities that have produced good consequences in your life, you would be foolish to trade it for the mere potentiality of youth. He says that in there. So those of you who are younger, you've got a lot of potentiality to navigate and produce good, right? Those who are older, mind yourselves carefully because if you have a good record, don't mess it up. How's that? See. So what happens then is in, in, in making this journey, selecting between potentialities and actualities, we run the possibilities to our belief grids. And sometimes it happens in a very, very short amount of time. Okay? For example, and I use this in, in college where kids are racking up student debts, I say to them, how many of you at the end of the session tonight would be willing to accept no strings attached, a cash gift of $500,000? Could I see your hand, please? The rest of you are being skeptical. There's no, there's no. See, what you did, what you told me is that you don't think money is, is a morally evil. You actually think you ran that through your belief grid and said, hey, this Thomas guy got cash to give away. I'm, I'm in for some of that because it will help me. And that happened just like that, see? Uh, um, if you had taken vows of poverty, you would be horrified by the pro proposal. Oh, no, no, I, I, I can't accept that because it would mess up life. Uh, I don't know what the tax implications of a $500,000 gift are, so we'll leave that alone. See. Now, sometimes the, the journey down through the belief grid can be very agonizing as when two high-level precepts conflict. And I think all of us have had this experience where you have choice A and you have choice B and neither one is good. And it reminds me, I had a young man in my office some months ago, he came to tell me that he had two calls to pastor ministry. He didn't know what you wanted to take. I said to him, you know, you're in a very fortunate position. You can't make a bad decision. How often in life do you get that? See, Anyway, um, he didn't quite think it was that exciting, but I thought it was pretty exciting. But what happens when two high-level elements are in conflict? 
You know, we know what happens. You lie awake at night. You can't sleep at night. Your mind is processing this. You're churning it. If I do this, if I do that. And um, eventually you have to sort things out. Uh, it can be a, a very challenging thing, see. The journey of the belief. And, and, you know, belief grids are so important to human experience that, that the whole belief grid is actually protected by an alarm system that we commonly call conscience. And I'm on a little campaign here to um, talk about conscience, to remind people that conscience is the thing that protects the integrity of human beings and therefore in protects the integrity of uh, society. And I'm going to be a little political here and say to you that when I read in the news that people have deliberately lied in a public setting to gain an end, I find that reprehensible. When people do that, when government people do that, they are tarnishing the integrity of a whole society. And the outcome of that is not going to be good, see. But the conscience, by the way, does not tell you right from wrong. It tells you when you have violated one of your codes that you have put in your belief grid. So if you put bogus things in your belief grid, you can still feel guilty even though you didn't do wrong. Right? Um, if you populate your belief grid with good things, then your conscience functions in, in, a, nice, in a nice way. Right. Of course, we all know that conscience can be dulled. A conscience can learn to be quiet, and I am deeply disturbed when I read articles that, uh, by some psychiatrists that they are finding from time to time children today who have no sense of right and wrong. And when I think of that, I'm reminded of the time I was invited to go to prison, not as an inmate, but to visit somebody. Um, this was a gentleman in maximum security, and he asked to see a clergyman, and he asked for an Adventist clergyman. Well, somehow the prison got a hold of me, even though I lived 20 minutes away. And so I said, well, I need to go visit him. And I remember going there, and I, I don't know if any of you have ever been in prison. I hope not as, a, as an inmate, but if, if you were, I'm glad you're out. Um, I went there, and you know, if you're going into maximum security, they take your shoes, they take your belt, they take your wallet, they take your watch, they take everything. They leave you just with your clothes. And they locked me in a room, and a few minutes later, a great big man came. He outweighed me probably by 40 pounds, and he could have picked me up and twirled me around on his two little fingers, I think. He was a big man. And we sat and we talked, and to this day, I have no recollection of what we talked about. For the simple reason, we hadn't been talking very long, and they looked at me and he said, you know, Reverend, I don't have a conscience. I could kill you right now, and I wouldn't have any pangs of, of remorse at all. So what do you think I wanted to do right then? I wanted out of there, see, that this man had destroyed it, apparently destroyed his conscience. There's no right or wrong anymore. And uh, I mean, I, I felt very unsafe. And uh, we, we talked for about 20 minutes and then he was happy and he went on his way or they came and got him, I don't remember which. And I was hoping like everything that they would remember who I was and let me out, which obviously they did. But, um, you know, a belief grid, the integrity of a person is associated with a honest and transparent journey through the belief grid that is protected by a conscience. And I think you all know that conscience can be dulled. It can also be restored by making apology or by readjusting the reference points. Okay? Um, when I was a little boy, my mother had a cookie jar in the kitchen. And she told us, boys, I don't want you eating cookies between meals. Now, we could go out to the garden and eat carrots and cabbage leaves and all of that, but she didn't want us eating cookies. And I remember on one occasion being so hungry that I ate a cookie between meals and my conscience troubled me. Um, when I go to my mother's house today, she doesn't have a cookie jar, she has a, a tin full of nuts. And when I go there, I help myself to those between meals. How bad? Why did my conscience bother me when I was a child and not now when I'm an adult? I've seared it, right? I've roasted it. No. I adjusted the reference point, okay? I understand why my mother didn't want us to eat cookies. But now I'm an adult, I made up my own decision, and I don't think eating a few nuts between meals is a terrible wrong. Okay. Maybe some of you will correct me later. Okay. So um, another piece I want to add to this 
is that as we, 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 we cobble together stories of reality and we draw down our reference points and we ensconce them in a belief grid that is monitored by conscience, I think as Christians it's also very important to understand that because life takes place at that interface, that's the interface at which the Holy Spirit interacts with humans. And you know the cartoon where you have a little um, devil on one shoulder and a little angel on the other one, uh, that kind of depicts <coughs> depict reality in a way that as you journey through life you get a sense, an impression, I should do this, I shouldn't do that. And if you inform your, your belief grid from the, the truth of Scripture, you can rest assured that the Spirit of God is urging you one way or another. And I, I like to make the point here that <clears throat> um, I think the best way to live life is not by praying for signs, but to be praying for convictions. Um, I have a little campaign on that subject too because I know too many people who prayed for a sign and what happens when you get your sign? Does it build faith? Or do you find yourself wondering if that was for real? And I cite for you the quintessential example of the fact that signs often produce doubt. A Gideon would be my number one witness. Okay. He gets a sign and what does he pray for immediately? Another one, and I could tell you other stories of people who prayed for signs and then found themselves doubting. How much better in the, in the journey of life to be praying for convictions to grow? Because convictions are much more deliberate things. They involve the mind, not just the magic of a sign. And uh, if you pray for convictions, they oftentimes start as silly thoughts. And as one who served as a dean for a long time in the School of Theology, I've talked to many, many young people who come in to study theology and they're wondering if they should do this. And I always make them tell me the story, well, what brought you here? And oftentimes they'll say, well, you know, I had this thought one day that I should do, become a pastor. And I thought, that's ridiculous, not me, no way, I'm not going to do that. Okay. But if a conviction is being driven by God, it, it begins to insert itself. It may come at first as a silly looking idea, but then it begins to grow until it sits in front of you and says, you're going to have to make a decision one way or the other. And so uh, I have found in my own life that when I operate by praying for convictions and following them that I have always been happy with the outcome. Always been happy with the outcome. Okay. Um, another thing I want to say about belief grids is that I think it's important for us to realize that as human beings we ascribe ultimate worth or value to the contents of our belief grids. Enough that we defer to the elements there. We defer to them. See? And the word for, for ascribing worth to something is the word worship. If you look at the etymology of the word worship, it means to ascribe worth to something. It means to be in awe of something. And so the point I'm making here is that the elements, especially the upper elements in your belief grid, are, that's the shrine at which you worship. And so, gentlemen, when you stand by, uh, what's the, the great car of today? A Subaru WRX? I don't know. That's college kids like. But you stand and you look at that car and you are fascinated by it and you dream about it. What are you doing? You're worshipping, right? Um, when you look at a handsome young man or a beautiful young woman and become quite absorbed by that, you are, in a sense, worshipping. When you look at your bank account, and become absorbed by it. And of course, as Christians, we are invited to put the things of God in the upper regions of a belief grid so that we worship in that particular uh, regard. Okay. So, the big challenge, and, and here I, I draw my, my talk to a conclusion as I think about things, that there are several, I call them drawdowns, there are several things that I hope you take from this. And the first is that the big challenge all of us face in life is to create a picture of reality that comports with reality itself. Now that's, that's actually a, a pretty tough assignment. How do you know that the view of reality you have actually comports to reality? And I, I don't think it's an easy thing. I think it's um, something that we, we, we learn along the way, but I am encouraged by one thing and also alarmed by the same thing. And that is that sooner or later, everything you think or do runs into reality. That's true in this life, but it's also true ultimately. 
So what do I mean that? Well, you could decide that, for example, that arsenic, all the talk about arsenic is bogus. That that's just people trying to scare you. And so you can do a very stupid thing and uh, imbibe some arsenic and what will you discover very quickly? Your idea will run into reality, right? Um, I, I think about um, the no-fault divorce that was such the rage back in the 1970s, and my apologies to those of you who may have been through a divorce. I'm not here to make light of your situation because it's a very wrenching experience. But I remember the optimism. We were going to get rid of all the wrangling in court, that you can divorce in 90 days and everything will be nice and clean. And we're learning today that there is no such thing as a clean divorce, that, that, that people are damaged and children are damaged. There's no way to escape without damage. You can recover from it, but you can't escape it. See, um, We could talk about other things. And, and God, does God exist or not? Well, you can say God does not exist, but I would just point out to you that that does not change the existence of God at all. The fact that you boldly announce there is no God has not affected, it has not changed, it has not affected the reality, yea or nay. And so everybody, what we believe, we're going to run into reality ultimately. See, And so that's one of the big challenges. How do you create a view of reality that actually comports with um, reality? A second one is that spirituality and religion are very important elements because they are the instruments or the mediums by which we make sense out of life. I am kind of distressed to see the number of people today who are walking away from religion. They think it's bogus. Uh, I would like to say to you, nobody walks away from religion. You might walk away from a certain kind of religion, but you do not walk away from the function of religion. Because religion can be broadly described as the way you live according to the belief structure you've, you've adopted. So I would even say that atheism is a religion. There's a belief structure and a certain way you live because of that belief structure. That's spirituality informing religion. No, all of us are both spiritual and religious. You may walk away from some certain kind of religion, but don't think that you'll ever walk away from religion as a function in life. We all have it. And it's by the, that means that we live sensibly and, and morally and, and we live with purpose and meaning. Um, I also mentioned the function of conscience that I think is very important, whether you are a believer or not, that you respect the function of conscience and you keep it in good order that you might live well and your society might would, would function well. And then worship is an instinctive and almost unavoidable function in human life. All of us worship. We worship every day. We worship all kinds of things. Um, as believers, we should worship God. Another one, what you feed your mind and imagination become the things that allure you and draw you forward into your future. And uh, I, I suppose as we get a little older, um, our imaginations are not quite as fired as when we're younger. And for those of you who are younger, I would strongly appeal to you to feed your mind with noble and good and godly things. See, Chase those dreams. They are, they are good ones. See. And then the last one that I want to mention here tonight is um, the Genesis 1 story. And um, wow, I could talk a lot about this one and I'll, I will talk a little bit about it. You know, it's really a tragedy that the Genesis 1 story today is involved in an endless, never-ending and fruitless debate between creationists and evolutionists that those um, debates rage on and on and on. I used to be involved in that debate to some extent. I used to collect evidence. I never got into any public debates, but I would get my weapons ready. Um, I've lost interest in that debate. I quite frankly don't care about that debate because it is not properly constituted. I might mention tomorrow uh, in more detail that it sits on what's called a split epistemology. It's on a philosophical error, which means neither side is actually telling the truth of the story. But I'll talk about that tomorrow afternoon. What I'm interested in tonight is that story is absolutely fascinating because of the way it provides a picture of reality for us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And right there you have a picture of reality that emerges. See? And that's where I think the beauty of the story, uh, of the story uh, comes. See?
So that's kind of my, my little uh, talk here tonight, is that um, the way we make sense out of reality is that we cobble together stories. And by the way, I should have mentioned that some of those stories are factually true and some of them are fables. And you know that fables can tell truth, right? Allegories can tell truth. I don't think any of you believe that Pilgrim's Progress or Chronicles of Narnia are factual. But do they tell you something about reality and life? Yes, they do. See, um, And so um, we, we, we cobble together these stories and we embed them in our lives. And then as communities, we gather around them and whole cultures gather around them. See, if I were talking about the American dream, we don't really know what that is, but we all like it and we're all supposed to be gathering around that, see. We gather around that and one of the challenges of modernity is it is driving people away from the center. Everybody is taking their own reality that the, uh, the social cohesion is breaking down because we have lost the idea that there's a central core of ideas around which a community has to gather and minimize their differences in order to achieve it. If you maximize difference, you break that apart. See? And so, um, think about, you You might want to think about it tonight as you go to bed and you, you have moments of reflection about the picture of reality, the stories that you have adopted, that you believe, the reference points they have created for you, and the preferred future which you envision, to which you strive. That's how we make sense of grand reality. So, are we going to have questions, answers, uh, prayer? What are we going to do, Ashley? My call. Well, I think I'll end with prayer, and then I'll stay by if some of you want to come and talk. And tomorrow afternoon, we can have a lot more uh, exchange. So, all right. Father in heaven, thank you for the crowd that came here tonight, and thank you for their attentiveness. Uh, as we go to our homes now and enter in on the Sabbath with joy. Lord, help us to think about what we believe and why we believe and how we're journeying in life. That our journeys might be journeys with integrity and with hope. And we hope to see you soon in Christ's name, amen.